Gary Jennings, uh, an associate editor of uh, Hypertension, and uh, this is Rian Toys, who's uh, deputy editor of the journal, and we've recently written a co an editorial commentary on guidelines, particularly as we've recently had uh, the European Society of Hypertension, European Society of Cardiology guidelines published, and uh, they are a very useful and, and very complete kind of document, but it raises a number of issues as far as uh, what are we doing guidelines for, what are we trying to get out of them, what are we trying to who's our audience, uh, for example. But uh, first, perhaps we could discuss, Rian, what uh, were the um, major changes that you saw coming out of this? What, what, did, what was your take on these guidelines? So, Gary, firstly, um, it was really great to be able to write this editorial with you, and it certainly was rather thought-provoking when one went through the massive document and the hundreds of references that were used to actually highlight the guidelines um, that were written by the European Society of Hypertension. Some aspects that really um, were provocative for me related to the concepts with respect to measurement of blood pressure and there has been some talk as to what is the best way we should be measuring or diagnosing hypertension in our populations. And of course, um, over the years, there's been tremendous effort in terms of suggesting home blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. And I guess this time the um, guidelines didn't come out that forceful or strongly with respect to how one should go about measuring blood pressure, and particularly outside the clinic. So um, I thought this was rather interesting and perhaps um, would like to know what you think about that. Yeah, well, certainly they said that out-of-office out of blood pressure has, a, has a, an important role, and I think they emphasise it a little bit more than in previous guidelines, but they certainly weren't prescriptive and very different to the British uh, guidelines, which suggested that uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be done in all hypertensives mm. uh, as long as it's available, not just on the basis of the value, but also uh, as far as um, management's concerned, but also because of, uh, on, the, on their evaluation of they considered it cost effective. So that was one difference with yes. this particular mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. guideline. Mm -hmm. But who do you think is going to use these guidelines given that they're 73 pages and 730 references? Is this something you think that uh, is going to be in every general practitioner's, uh, primary practitioner's office or is this something that's a resource, a background resource that others might draw on? I think you bring up a very important point. Um, remember, we are supposed to be targeting very busy general practitioners or um, allied healthcare workers, and I don't think they're going to have the time to go through these reams of pages and um, hundreds of references. And so I think you're correct in that this will be a very um, powerful document that one would, could refer to, but really in terms of a referral document, I always believe that um, in the GP's office, and usually these are very busy uh, general practitioner offices or clinics, um, we need something very simple, you know, five easy steps into this or that. And um, so in terms of who will be actually looking at these um, guidelines, uh, I can't imagine that it will be at the level of the family practitioner or the GP. But for sure we need to acknowledge that it is a very comprehensive document sure. and the authors did a fantastic job in terms of collating the most up-to-date evidence. But in terms of the practicality, um, I think that we may fall a little short in terms of the actual applicability at the end of the day. Yeah, but, and to be fair, these, these documents are generally followed up by a short guide that uh, perhaps is more, is more practical uh, mm -hmm. to use. One of the other things that uh, I wondered in reading these was really how applicable they're going to be in different scenarios. I think it's a very different thing to be recommending or considering echocardiography or ambulatory blood pressure or monitoring or um, other kinds of um, other kinds of evaluation in a in a wealthy developed community mm -hmm. uh, with good access to uh, to all those diagnostic resources compared to some resource areas and these were meant to apply all over Europe yes. where uh, you yeah. know, not everybody's in the same mm -hmm. situation as far as those facilities are concerned. Yes, um, I think this is once again a very important point and of course um, in Europe the, the idea is to target um, every 
at every level the, and every country within Europe the, um, the usage of such guidelines. But we do need to remember that the resources, the infrastructure is very different across um, the different uh, cities of the different countries. And for sure what may be applicable or easily um, available in some centers may not be available at all. And I guess the same goes with some of the medications, the drugs. We know that in some areas, drugs that may be easily accessible in some countries may just not be available in others. So for sure, um, in terms of not only um, will it be the general practitioner using the guidelines, but it may have different value mm. in different countries. I, I, I agree with you. And that's what actually makes it, I guess, very complex in terms of coming out with a uniform guideline. Yes, and it's not just a European thing, it's all around the world. There are, there's diversity even in a large country such as the United States. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Getting on to the drugs that you mentioned, mm. and, you're, and you're right, some of them are more available, some of them are more affordable in different places to different people. Uh, these guidelines weren't very prescriptive, pres prescriptive about what sort of drugs you should mm -hmm. use. They mm. kind of said any of the major drug classes mm -hmm. are, uh, are a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and this uh, differed from, say, previous um, US guidelines, which said start with a thiazide, yes. or thiazide like mm -hmm. diuretic, mm -hmm. or the British guidelines, which uh, omitted beta blockers from the first line. Do you have any thoughts on mm -hmm. uh, that? Yes, um, I think all our current guidelines, if one looks at the Canadian, as you say, or the American, or the British, you're absolutely correct. There are um, specifications or suggestions as to specific drugs that should be used but it was interesting to note that in these guidelines put out by the European Society of Hypertension um, the idea was really to just bring down the blood pressure and it seems that based on the evidence the effects of any of the classes may be um, similar so um, once again this may be interesting with respect to um, practicality perhaps and, and just for the reasons you mentioned because of the availability of some drugs the cost of some drugs maybe the approach um, will be a little bit more useful than being so prescriptive sure um, when uh, one of the things that are really of great interest in hypertension at the moment is the management of resistant hypertension mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that are not responding to three or four standard antihypertensive drugs and I think these guidelines rightly draw attention to the fact that uh, sometimes that's because the pe people are not taking their tablets, sometimes it's because they haven't really got hypertension out of, out of the office, mm. uh, sometimes it's, um, it's because they've got secondary causes of their hypertension. Uh, they talk about uh, uh, escalating the drug therapies and making sure that uh, the patient has at least uh, the, the optimal drug utilization but then there are some new techniques mm -hmm. available which uh, were skirted on in, this yes, in these mm -hmm. guidelines so renal denovation is an example yes, uh, yes. what did you think of that view on that you know I thought it was really interesting that um, these device based technologies are being introduced as therapies today um, I think it's important that our hypertension community knows about um, the new devices and um, for sure they probably hold tremendous promise. Um, I think the guidelines were quite cautious in saying that obviously this shouldn't be used in all patients with resistant hypertension. Um, and we should also remember that in most countries today, such devices are not available yet for clinical usage. Um, in most countries, I believe that such devices um, such as renal denovation um, is really only available for research trial type um, usage. It would be great if uh, everybody that uh, was subjected to these procedures went into a, a registry or a, or a controlled clinical trial so that we really weren't left wondering with what the value, what the place of this is in future and uh, we didn't have just un, un, um, controlled use from uh, very excited interventional cardiologists and, and radiologists who, uh, who will no doubt be very keen to take up a new technique like this. I agree, I agree Gary and um, I think it's an interesting time as we question actually where are we going with guidelines and I, I'm interested to know from you what you think 
the next phase in this whole guideline world is actually going to be? And will we be bringing out another set of guidelines in the near future? Well, I, th I think you need the resource. I think you need the work and the thinking behind it. Of course, there are very different ways that have been approached by different authorities around the world, mm. for example. Uh, there's always uh, big holes in the data. Mm. And, you know, you, we just don't have information on mm. some of the judgments that need to be made. And with these guidelines, I think these very authoritative committees um, made a call on some of the things that perhaps aren't um, really proven as far as randomised controlled trials are concerned. Mm. In the US though, for example, with JNC8, a much different approach is being taken, really consolidating uh, the attention on the things that there is a good, good mm. um, body of evidence for and, and uh, evaluating that evidence. So that will no doubt then uh, leave some areas which, um, which people want to know and have to deal with every day in practice, mm -hmm. not, not covered. So that's a problem. What I'd like to see in future, though, I think, is much more specific patient-centred um, decision support algorithms, which I don't see why they can't be available on people's smartphones. They're all everyone's mm. got those around the mm. world or on your uh, medical database, which doesn't just say that this is a hypertensive male, mm -hmm. uh, mm. but this is somebody that has the following comorbidities, has this level of blood pressure, and helps the doctor decide what are the um, targets, the appropriate targets, and perhaps we might talk about targets for blood pressure. What are the appropriate um, drugs to avoid in that mm. situation? What are good combinations that might be able to help? What are the right investigations to do that will mm. get you very quickly and effectively to answer the important questions in, in someone that presents like that? So individualised decision support, which is a much more complex thing than a, than a, um, uh, a generic guideline uh, for the whole world, yes. uh, I, but I think it's the way that we're going to assist people in primary care to manage this huge burden of hypertension that we're trying to deal with. So Gary, it sounds like you're talking very much in line of personalised medicine, and is this how you think we should well, be thinking with respect I, to I the patients we see in our clinics? Yes, mm. it's not the hyped up kind mm -hmm. of personalised medicine where you, you start with a a patient in a gene and yes. or a set of genes and, and direct your therapy mm. that way mm. but it's it's just conceptually it's the same it's mm. individualizing care mm. as opposed to coming up with mass recommendations mm -hmm. that are going to uh, suit um, the average patient but as you know in your practice and mine we don't see many of the average patients exactly. we seem to see uh, mm -hmm. just about anything else let's talk about the targets mm. for treatment because um, in these guidelines, they kind of loosened them up a little bit. They did, um, they did, which was a little surprising, yeah. actually, yes. And that mm. seemed to be based on some new evidence, mm. but it's mostly analysis of large trials yes. done for other things. And, and old trials, too, mind you, mm. that have sort of been re-looked at. That's mm -hmm. right. Seems to me that's one of the areas where it'd be great to have a, a really good science, mm. well-powered mm. trial with systolic blood pressure as the endpoint, not yes. diastolic yes. like the old ones. Mm. and. Uh, and to try and uh, you know settle that once and for all. Mm. I'm not sure, you know, again, in the clinic, uh, that it always matters that much whether your you know your diastolic target's 85 or 80, because I don't think we've got the capacity to dial things up mm. that mm -hmm. well, and I'm not sure we can reach it in, in lots of people. Lots true, of patients. true. Uh, but it would be good to know whether 140 or 90 is fine. Uh, we really shouldn't be too bothered or whether we should follow the epidemiology which says the lower the better. Yes, yes, I agree and, and um, I think before we can be that dogmatic we will need those very well controlled trials. So I still guess there's much work to be done and um, it'll be interesting to see how these guidelines are actually used and we wait anxiously to see what the JNC8 is going to tell us and how those actually do differ to these European society guidelines. It certainly will, and uh, and I think uh, that'll keep a lot of committees and a lot of people very interested in the meantime. Indeed, uh, People indeed. have got to manage hypertension in the clinic, and uh, this, this is a great resource for them. Indeed, indeed. So thank, thank you, Gary. Thank you.